Please welcome to the stage our next panel, What Realities Are We Reading? Local News Deserts and Polarization, with CNN Chief National Affairs Correspondent Jeff Zeleny, Daily Yonder Editor Tim Merrima, and Silvio Rivera, Director of the MacArthur Foundation's Local News Program. This conversation will be moderated by IOP Founding Director David Axelrod. Morning, everybody. Uh, I've got a, just a couple of items I need to cover before we get into the conversation. One is, um, I just want to give a shout out to to Zenot and to Heidi and the staff, Jen Steinauer and the whole staff of the IOP. I'm so these sessions have been breathtaking. This conference is a triumph. Uh, we're covering a subject that is vastly undercovered and. Uh, I want to thank you for all the work that you put in here. Second, I want to say I've got three objectives here. I want to talk about what's happened to local news, the communities that have been most affected, and the impact of that. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, solutions uh, to that. And if we don't cover those three things, it will not be the fault of the panel, but the moderator. So uh, let's, let's hope we can get through it. Now, um, on June 14th, 1976, I walked into the newsroom of the Chicago Tribune as an uh, intern and then became a reporter there. And the thing that I remember is walking into this ornate tower on Michigan Avenue, this uh, incredible building, and into a newsroom that was three stories tall with an observation deck around it so the public could come and see the bustle below where hundreds of reporters and editors worked and uh, were in contact with correspondents all over the world. And it was, a th it was a place that just pulsated with energy. You walk down Michigan Avenue today and the tower is still there and it's still quite impressive, but it's a condominium. And across the street where the Sun Times used to be is Trump Tower. So if, enough, if anything encapsulates the challenges for local media, I think that, that is it. Um, so Tim, I want you to talk about what, how this has impacted particularly rural communities, underserved communities, because we've lost 2,500 newspapers since 2005, and disproportionately, these news deserts that have been created are in rural areas and underserved community. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, this made me think of, I worked at the Durham newspaper for many years, and that building, which we moved into so proudly around 1990, is now self-storage. So uh, another example. Um, the, what I've observed over the years is that one of the first signs of the weakening market of traditional journalism was that the Metro Daily system and its feeders of bureaus, which did such an important job of uniting states uh, to, so that you knew what was going on across the state, um, that those began to erode. I'm from Eastern Kentucky. The Louisville Courier Journal was instrumental in, in uh, covering the con economic conditions, uh, the effects of strip mining, um, you know, and could, could be considered instrumental in the, the entire development of the war on poverty. That's the kind of impact that system would have of a statewide newspaper. That eroded, and I think during the Great Recession, we saw a lot of decline. The, pan the weeklies, I think, were left undisturbed for longer, and then I think with the pandemic, uh, they've eroded significantly. And now um, the civic information that we rely on to, I think someone said, to see ourselves in our community, um, those local papers play an important role there. 
Um, there are some that are still thriving, uh, some that are hanging on, um, and of course some that, many that have closed. One of my favorite papers is in the panhandle, was in the panhandle of Texas, uh, the Canadian record. Uh, Lori Ezel Brown was a second generation editor and she closed last year because she couldn't find a buyer. And this is a paper that you would, the Chamber of Commerce would put in their promotional materials about what their community was like. That's what we're losing, I think. What about this as a culprit? When I was working, uh, when I first started working back there in the Pleistocene age at the Tribune, uh, it was thick with advertising, display advertising, classified advertising. Uh, what is the economic uh, viability of newspapers? Maybe I'll, uh, Sylvia, I'll throw this to you. You run the local news project at MacArthur. Uh, it, it feels as if we're searching for some economic basis uh, f to support local news because this and digital, the digital world has completely undercut local journalism. Sure, so the digital environment has just shifted the entire economics of what we knew to support local news. Um, and just thinking about you know, your experience starting in 1976 as an intern. You don't have to keep repeating the years. <laughs> I made the point. But you know, just thinking and thanks about thanks for using the old picture of me. Here too. <laughs> thinking about how much has happened since then, just in terms of media consolidation and all of the factors that have driven us to this moment. So it's just poor, you know, policy making and just you know things that undermined um, the the business viability of local um, newspapers um, because of profit driven interests. On top of that, you layer the environment of how you access news and information uh, via digital media. And that's really what we're trying to, to solve for right now, that mm -hmm. there is a spectrum of, you know, how does mainstream legacy media survive in this new environment, recognizing that the economics have changed, but also that there was um, perhaps not enough um, around centering the community in their, in their coverage, and so that trust also wasn't there, especially when you're thinking about um, you know, communities that have traditionally not been represented adequately by media. Um, and then you look at the smaller sort of startups, which vary from you know, commercial to nonprofit, and you think about their needs in terms of, you know, they're trying to come up with business models in areas that are not only news deserts, but they're also transit deserts, they're food deserts, they're and they're, deserts. And they're, and they're, they're, they're economically challenged, exactly. which I think is a common element here. Uh, Jeff, you, you know, you're such an erudite guy that uh, people uh, don't necessarily recognize the fact that you were a kid in rural Nebraska, uh, and you uh, grew up on a farm, and your journalism career began at in local news in rural Nebraska. Talk about that experience. Uh, it's true, my first byline was at the Fillmore County News uh, in my town of 700 people. I graduated from high school in a class of 12 in public school. But one thing that was central um, around our uh, dinner table on our farm was uh, newspapers and news magazines. But I think the, um, and yes, my first daily newspaper was at the York News Times. When I interviewed later for a job at the New York Times, I was too sort of shy and embarrassed to uh, say that my first daily newspaper job was at the York News Times. The same like, <laughs> same typeface, they just flipped the word. And I always regretted that because it would have been fun to uh, tell Jill Abramson and Bill Keller that. I'm not sure if I would have got hired or not. But anyway, um, but I think a lot about this because I travel around uh, the country covering politics and other things. Uh, I listen to the radio a lot. And I think one of the fundamental, um, you can obviously draw a straight line from the fact that um, now questions about our institutions and democracy are front and center in our public lives. And um, you know, some politicians and former presidents have been very successful in getting people to question institutions. But I think that the, 
um, the death or the challenges of local news um, are very much related to that. But I think that we're going to get into that. yeah, like we can have a business discussion, obviously. But trust, I think, is the biggest thing. And people used to trust their weekly newspaper because you had the sports scores in there, who was visiting who, who might have got uh, picked up for speeding. I devoured all that. I love that. But the reality is, uh, you know, I think the radio offers us. Um, a lot of instructive uh, um, uh, points to our, our position right now because it's the nationalization of news. There used to be local radio programs talking about the news of the day. And I was talking with a great friend of mine, a Kay Henderson at Radio Iowa. She's the news director um, at, at a Radio Iowa who supplies news content to all the stations across Iowa. And now they largely have Sean Hannity on there. Um, and this isn't a new phenomenon. Obviously, Rush was on a lot of these stations, but there are no longer, often cases, uh, local um, uh, news uh, or um, opinion announcers. So I think everything has become nationalized. The local news has sort of really suffered from this. And because of that, I think our trust and credibility in people's eyes also has. So I think it's a big, big challenge. So, Tim, um, the the... the you know, I'm deeply concerned, as everyone here is, on the impact of, on our democracy of this. But talk about it from a more local standpoint. What does it mean to communities not to have pesty, assiduous reporters like young Jeff Zeleny poking around the city council meeting? And uh, um, I, too, am uh, glad you're erudite, but came from Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Turns out Nebraska's a lot more erudite than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> we're think, already bridging the divide. I think that's why we're here. <laughs> yes. Um, the, uh, um, it's, it's, I would say that local journalism is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, it is one of the things that you need in a community to be civically healthy. It doesn't mean you're going to be civically healthy, but if it's not there, your chance of being civically healthy and resilient is diminished. Just like the analogy would be broadband. I'm not going to be an entre a successful entrepreneur because I have broadband, but I'm not going to be successful if I don't have it. So I would put local news in that category um, so that we're informed about the uh, activities closest to home that are about democracy. One thing that I think is very difficult is to think that if we bring it back, that it's going to replace the uh, talk radio and uh, Christian broadcasting and sermon topics that are, there's a whole system for distributing those messages into places where local news has declined. And so I'm, I'm raising the question in my own mind about how, what, how you gain that public space back, and it may not be what had it before. What about, uh, Sylvia, uh, what about, the, um, what about the, the sense of community, of community and the self-image of communities uh, does, do local news outlets add, and the absence of them, what is the impact of that? I mean, d does it build, help build community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just to pull on the thread um, that's come up in terms of trust building and sort of taking a broader view of this isn't just about journalism, but it's about healthy civic information. Um, and understanding that, you know, if, if, we, if we back up and we look at it from the context of understanding our community's information needs, where are people receiving, getting their information from? How are, how are they currently receiving and what type of information needs um, do they have? Um, you, you start learning more about how to build up that civic trust because you start learning that, you know, we, we like using the term news deserts um, and, not, and you know, I, some of the peers in the space use the term, you know, I, I like using the term information gardens. There's always something there. Um, and so how do we strengthen and, and catalyze that uh, and begin to connect people to very basic information so that they can thrive in their communities. And sometimes that information is, you know, how to vote in a local election. 
you know, who, you know, how this impacts, you know, school board, you know, information, um, how to access the, the COVID vaccine, you know, just as an example, uh, in, in 2020, lack of reliable news and information was a life and death situation. Uh, one of the partners that I worked with um, in Arizona started a WhatsApp group in her community because she was not receiving reliable news and information on, during the pandemic about the COVID-19. You know, COVID and so she had to start a WhatsApp group, build community. She had the trust of the community. She developed this community to share information uh, and to also uh, make sure that she was stopping mis and disinformation from, from occurring in the, in the community and making sure that the information was in Spanish because this community was not receiving proper, mm -hmm. a, a proper uh, information. And so it's so important to really uplift and strengthen those institutions on the ground who might not even be you know, traditional newsrooms but are information providers um, and making sure that we're including them as part of this broader conversation. I was standing out uh side and uh, Gloria Lara, who I think is in here somewhere, there she is, uh, who uh, is the uh, chair of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, uh, told me about the work that a small paper in Holland, Michigan uh, was doing to expose, um, there was a new group, uh, kind of ideologically driven group uh, who took over the city council and uh, did a whole bunch of things very quickly without following procedure uh, to impose their uh, will, and uh, this was brought to light because journalists do what journalists do and shine uh, bright lights in dark corners. Uh, and so uh, that is an asset that every community needs. But Jeff, um, I know you spend a lot of time, and one of the reasons you're so good at what you do is sort of translating communities uh, to each other and particularly rural communities to uh, a national uh, audience. Um, when I was reporting and I went into a small town, I used to look for the reporters who covered the town to ask them what was going on and to get the lay of the land. Do you think the, uh, that the, uh, diminish the diminishment of local news sources has made it harder for the rest of the country to get a genuine picture of what rural communities are like, of what they're going through, of, of their strengths, uh, so as to avoid the kind of caricatures that we've seen? I think without question. I mean, every national reporter uh, knows that uh, there are very few original or unique stories. They always start in the weekly paper or the local paper or on local TV. So I think absolutely. And I, too, when I was starting out, um, you know, when I walked in the doors of the Chicago Tribune, not quite as long ago as you, but quite a All while right, ago. Okay. I think, I think I we've think beaten this 90s, to death. <laughs> it was still not a condo. It was still, uh, I was an intern there in 96. But anyway, you know, you, you were sent out to a place in Illinois or Wisconsin, um, and you would talk to the local. I, I love going in and talking to, like, the weekly editor, you know, what's going on. Now, good luck. I mean, there literally are not... Um, that many local newspapers around. And, and at the same time, um, our friend Jim Warren, a former Chicago Tribune, um, longtime columnist and editor, he's working for a, a project called NewsGuard now, and he just had a story or a study last week. There actually are growing publications, but they're sort of fake publications. Yes, I wanted to and ask about that. And that's another sort of, the, I mean, never mind the lack of information, the disinformation mm -hmm. is another sort of challenge. But back to your point about uh, explaining communities. I think, absolutely, I think we have a much, um, much less of an understanding about uh, what you know, communities are going through, what they're thinking. And it's not just red and blue. I mean, we have somehow uh, managed to, um, you know, and we, when I say we, I mean, I hold the media to blame and me to blame for this as well, because we look at every state and county through a political lens. A lot, of people blame, a lot of people blame you personally for that. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> as long as you pay your cable bill. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, which is another problem we'll get to on a second panel. But, um, but no, I think there is a lack of understanding. And I think the biggest thing is, I always tell people um, when I'm at a Trump rally or I'm at a Biden rally or other things, talking to people individually, you're really amazed at how, um, you know, 
a lot of similarities exist. Uh, you know, the group think does not necessarily exist uh, as much. I love interviewing, uh, I'm just talking to people um, one-on-one, -on -one, but I think our point is, I always tell them, we're here to inform. I think our job as journalists is to give people information so you can decide what to think, as opposed to, uh, I think some people have the perception that we're trying to tell people what, how to think. I don't view that as my role or our role at all, but you have to have uh, the basic information so people know how to think, and I think that is one of the things that's gone. And members of Congress and others, um, most of them, or a lot of them, do not hold news conferences anymore, talk to reporters, so I think there's just this uh, um, epidemic uh, for a lack of information, which leads to a lack of empathy, and at the same time, a rise in disinformation uh, which really is a, a big challenge for the country. Well, I want to pick up on that, Tim. There are these, I mean, and we're going to talk one, in one second about sort of potential solutions, and you all are involved in uh, alternatives to, uh, to this that, that are helpful. But this, this thing that Jeff brings up, I think they're called pink slime okay. outlets, but these sort of pop-up news, uh, so-called news outlets that are really... Uh, sort of propaganda outlets that pose as local news outlets. Talk about that. How pervasive a problem is that? Honestly, I can't say with any certainty. Um, I see them. Um, and some of them will carry what looks like um, adequate news along with an article that clearly uh, is uh, skewed uh, tremendously and contains information that, you know, it, it, it does not pass muster. So it's almost, it's almost confusing within those publications themselves. But so, that, that's sort of insidious because yes. it, it, it has enough, uh, enough substance to it to... Uh, reel people in and give them a sense that this is a, a legitimate news site, uh, and then it slips the bitter pill in with the applesauce. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's a problem that the sites uh, in total exist that way, and then parts of it. Um, I don't see, I think that it is a problem. I don't see people using it locally that way. I think people are smart enough unless you already uh, have taken the bait on that kind of discussion, then it's red meat to the lions. And I think, in my opinion, that the audience for that type of thing is more uh, focused than general community. It certainly doesn't help, but I think there's still people who know uh, what news looks like, and, and this is primarily for a distinct uh, rabid audience, perhaps. Sylvia, I just want one last thing on the sort of problem side of the equation, but it's one any veteran of the Tribune would be sensitive to and people all over the country. Newspapers have become uh, sort of prey for hedge funds who have bought bunches of them and basically sucked the profit out of them uh, while slowly strangling them uh, how big a problem has that been, and has it touched on uh, rural communities? Yes, I think it's a it's a huge problem. I, I don't think that um, it should you know be happening, and I think that um, there have been a lot of models to try to counter um, that trend, including um, you know even you know here in Chicago just thinking about um, the merger between the Chicago Sun-Times and uh, Chicago Public Media. So there are models and innovations that are looking to try to solve for the issue of um, making sure that we preserve um, local news in, in our cities. Um, but well, I can- Let me just interrupt you for a second because I, I should have said this at the beginning. Not only have we lost 2,500 uh, outlets, but we've also lost 45 something, 46,000 journalists from reporting. And so what you have are news outlets that may be legacy media, but they're operating without Fair the bone. staff to actually do the job that, you, that they once did. Absolutely, and so 
this is the problem that we're all trying to solve for, is just, you know, what do we do with the fact that there are gutted newsrooms um, for legacy uh, media, and um, what are the economics that we can help to catalyze and solve for, but then also, there are newsrooms that are emerging in, in sort of the ashes of these spaces, right? And, and to supplement um, what's not being covered by uh, these bare bone institutions. They also need a certain level of capacity building and mm -hmm. support. And so when we're looking at this, we really have to look at this as an ecosystem and we're starting to see how, you know, maybe the, the collaborations that were unheard of, you know, back in the day, um, between uh, newspapers and newsrooms. Well, and you mentioned one. Right, now they're happening because we realize that this is, you know, we're all in this together and that collaboration is going to be key, you know, for us to figure out a pathway to creating um, jobs, uh, to creating sustain sustainable enterprises, and that that's gonna look differently in different communities depending on the environment. And MacArthur, just to switch over to the solution side of things, MacArthur is investing in these projects in a significant way. Absolutely. So MacArthur Foundation took lead. Can we in... call that person back later? <laughs> they have a solution. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, MacArthur took lead uh, in developing really what I see as a movement uh, called Press Forward. Uh, so MacArthur Foundation uh, and Knight Foundation and many others have invested in this idea that if we revitalize local news, we're also strengthening our democracy. And so that call to action as a floor has uh, really put a price tag, not a price tag, but has mobilized at least $500 million in this idea, uh, in these pooled resources, and really thinking about um, how do we um, catalyze growth across the country um, and, and strengthen newsrooms and strengthen ideas that might allow uh, local news to flourish. Uh, in addition to that, um, provide catalyzing support for an, an additional $500 million um, in local press Good to be chapters. MacArthur. It is good to be MacArthur. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're a part of that movement and that coalition. But at MacArthur, we also have our, our own local news strategy that we're developing, um, keeping in mind what all of our peers in the space are trying to do to help you know, inject um, capacity into the space. Tim, talk about the Daily Yonder. It's been around now for almost 15 years, uh, and that is a sort of pioneering effort along these lines. T talk about what you guys are doing. Um, uh, the original editors were Bill Bishop and Julie Artery. Um, Bill wrote the book The Big Sort and is still a contributing editor and so very helpful in how we got going. Um, the idea was that uh, there was a, a lack of rural voices within the national discussion and, and also um, there's a lot of good rural coverage now but it's not, it's it's to rural America and it's for the urban areas. The New York Times rightfully is edited for an international audience. Uh, not, it's not thinking every day, how do I represent, uh, who are the people we're reaching in rural America and what is it they need to know and what is the best way culturally to talk about these things. So that's what we've tried to do at a national level on policy, We've done experiments with pushing our content localized to newspapers in partnership. Uh, we've got people uh, in different localities who write about places and also beats. Um, so it is, a, uh, it is a newsroom, but it's unlike any I've ever been in. For one, it's virtual, but um, it's, it's a, it's a uh, an effort to bring rural America to the attention of a wider audience, to make rural America visible to itself, and to also help other journalists cover rural America. That's great. Do you, uh, how do you, uh, so you market, who do you market to, I guess is the question. You say you want to bring it to a wider audience. Do people who don't live in rural America 
read the Daily Yonder? I, I certainly will after this conversation. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, I remember early on seeing that uh, we had so few readers, if you saw it on the Google uh, analytics, you could tell who was reading it. Oh, there's Richard Oswald in Missouri. <laughs> um, or there's a foundation in New York, which was even better um, in some ways. Um, I think we started with a network of rural practitioners, activists, funders, service providers. Uh, through uh, another project of the Center for Rural Strategies, the Rural Assembly. And so we had this kind of uh, network to work with, and then uh, government officials, um, uh, congressional offices, you know, we've kind of built concentric circles around th this core audience. Our goal now, through a lot of, through commercial radio, uh, podcast, video, and distribution of text and photos, trying to reach uh, an audience that is not uh, that is not rural activist, but rural culturally. And I think that's where the challenge is to make kind of that hump. So that how, it's how a do you general. How do you fund this? Is it by subscription or? We have a small donor base of of readers. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have foundation support throughout this um, because some foundations have realized at different times that rural America is uh, a place that needs to be considered and that needs to have a vehicle like this uh, to provide information both to rural America and as a listening post for the rest of the country. Yeah, it strikes me. I mean, this is called bridging the divide and it's it, it goes both ways. I mean, I listened to the previous panel. Those stories need to be told to a larger audience, but we have deaths of despair right here in the city of Chicago, that, uh, and that story needs to be told too because we share a common humanity. Um, so how, this is a big challenge of our time, is how do we get people to consume information, real information about the way people are living all over the country and not just in our own silo? Um, uh, Jeff, I, the one question I forgot to ask before was the one sort of local news outlet that seems still to be meaningful, meaningfully operating. I, not, there are plenty of great local newspapers. I don't want to suggest otherwise. But local TV seems to still, people s still seem to be watching it. I mean, like when I was in politics, and I think still today, you think about getting on the local news because people seem to t trust their local newscasters and there's a wholesomeness to it. I think without a doubt. And you know, uh, Pew has done a lot of studies on trust in the media, um, huge disparities in local media. You know, local reporters and anchors and the weather person and sports person are very much um, more uh, respected and trusted as a news source. So you still see um, a lot of political ads uh, in local news. One of my favorite things to do is I travel all across the country is just watch local news and things. But they are, um, you know, suffering the same or enduring the same challenges um, with lack of advertising. I mean, you mentioned uh, the phone. I mean, like, this is everyone's biggest competition now. Yeah. Um, so I do think that that um, certainly is an issue. And the nationalization of things. Most of these local uh, news stations are owned by just a few companies. Yes. If it's Nextdoor or Sinclair or other things. Um, so I think that that is That may suddenly well. have their own but agendas as well. Exactly. And I think that one of the things is we sort of look at a map of the country. I mean, we talk about gerrymandering a lot, and that is obviously an issue in our uh, divide, but also just uh, geographic um, uh, locating. I mean, how people are moving out of rural yeah. areas. And sorting. I still, yeah, geographic sorting. Thank you. And of the uh, 12 people that I went to uh, high school with in my small town of Exeter, which is... Probably improved your chances bit, of getting on one of the sports teams. Huh? It actually didn't. I was a terrible athlete, shocker. Uh, the only way I was going to make it onto the University of Nebraska football field was in the band, which I was, but uh, separate conversation. But uh, most of those people... Uh, my classmates have gone away and moved away. So I think the uh, 
that's another huge challenge, obviously. Um, the, the population is much, uh, is much older. Uh, my 84-year-old mother um, is probably more connected than ever before still living on the farm because of the high-speed internet. So people are connected in that respect, but it's also sort of uh, divided them in their own uh, circles. So, um, but I do think a local news to answer your question is one sort of thing. And, we'll, um, and one small plug, um, as, as we were talking earlier, there are some upsides. There are a lot of new news organizations, one in Nebraska, the Flatwater Free Press. We were just talking about this. So yes, it takes money from... Uh, corporations and foundations, but there's a lot of storytelling that still exists out there. And if you think about it, a lot of the things sort of recently in terms of holding officials to account has been done by average citizens. So the, the rise of, of citizen journalism with the phones sort of creates a separate issue, but I don't think that all is lost. I mean, storytelling is still something that is uh, essential to who we are. We all love good stories, but I just think that uh, this will be done in a very, very, very different way. Yeah, and I just, you know, Block Club Chicago here. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, subscribe to Bridge Michigan, which is mm -hmm. really, really does a great job of covering the state. There's good journalism going on. The question is, how do you continue to support it? How do you, how do they raise the resources to expand what they're doing? To have the layers of editorial supervision uh, that are necessary. Um, have we? Do we have the answers to that? Because you mentioned the Sun-Times and, and public radio. I mean, they're struggling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take a lot of experimentation and a lot of you know, bumps along the road to figure out um, what, what the right mix and what the right model is. Um, but I think, one of the, when, again, when we're looking at upside and things that I'm excited about, is that I feel like there's a shift in the conversation in positioning local news and information as part of the civic infrastructure of communities as really a utility. Um, and you know, one of the, the partners that, that we fund out in uh, the Bay Area, they service, they, they, they're a newsroom for a Mayan community, a small community and, and Latino community. And the founder there you know, said something that I, I found really resonated with me. And she said that you know, she really views her newsroom in the same way that she views any other sort of community organization. And that's that her service, the service that she's providing her community is information. And that information is going to help her community connect with resources, understand the issues of the day and help them engage. Um, and so when you think about it from that perspective, it sort of starts opening up the world of opportunities because you really see how local news and information is a public health issue. It is a workforce development issue. It is, you know, about all of the issues. It's connected to all of the issues that we care about. And it begins to open up the possibility uh, for how we might think about funding and creating business models for this type of work. Uh, I guess the challenge is to also earn trust that the information that you're dis disseminating is information that can be trusted. And Absolutely. You mentioned the word trust earlier. Tim, uh, we're both old. Uh, We've established that uh, <laughs> ink-stained wretches, we used to yeah. call them, yeah. uh, who worked at uh, newspapers. It was expensive to publish newspapers. I mean, that's one of the issues, isn't it, that uh, printing newspapers, uh, that was 80% of the cost, everything involved with printing it, distributing it, and so on. That should be advantageous to digital journalism. It's it's cheaper. It, that's right. The costs of entering the market are much lower, which is also why you can have uh, ghost newspapers and pink slime, because it's all, you had to have capital to, ha to print a newspaper. You don't have to have that for a, a news site. Um, it seems that the, the, the cost of entry um, being low should and it has. There's a whole field of nonprofit news organizations now. Um, it's still emerging. I think it's a question of uh, for rural areas. You know, the the money. Um, those are by and large urban centered because that's where the funding is, and that's where the market is, and that's where the donors are. And um, so the question for me is, how do we move these new models into an economy that is 
quite different and already needs market interventions for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just one question about, uh, Jeff mentioned sort of access to um, digital resources. Um, how does it impact on communities that are impoverished communities uh, where they may not be wired mm -hmm. uh, and where broadband is less accessible? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, I've been in my role for three months and, you know. You're doing well so far. I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've, I've had the benefit of just talking to a lot of folks in the space who are doing really um, exciting and innovative work. And, you know, some of these solutions, you know, may feel old school, but, you know, it's what works for that community. Um, we're talking about community radio, especially in uh, areas that don't have access or that are uh, broadband uh, deficient. Uh, some folks are still, you know, working with both uh, print and digital. Um, and, you know, there's also just, you know, traditional sort of physical <laughs> community bulletin boards as well. So there's just, there are so many innovations that are coming out of this. Um, and I think that we need to think um, holistically about you know, how we're delivering uh, this critical news um, and information to folks. So uh, it just occurred to me because someone wrote it <coughs> on this screen that I should remind you that we're gonna take questions in, in a minute. And there's microphones lined up, which I also forgot. But look for the microphones. They're, they're here, 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 or there, um, whatever. Um, but we'll be back to you in a second. Before, um, before we take the questions, I just want to give each of you a chance to say what the most important thing we could do to bridge that news divide and make local news more available to communities that are now struggling to get local news. And Jeff, I want you to end on the question of what is our responsibility as citizens to seek out reliable news outlets and how do we help people do that? Well, I'll just, I'll tap into the ethos of Press Forward in that this has to be a movement and there need to be a lot of stakeholders and there need to be stakeholders from all sides of the political spectrum and understanding that we need reliable, trustworthy information in order to participate in our community, in our society, um, to keep our democracy um, healthy. And so we need to think about this in the context of, you know, who are all the people, you know, from educators to policymakers to, um, you know, the, the broad spectrum of, of, of spaces that we need to strengthen, that we need to, you know, come together to bring light to the fact that, um, you know, this is more than just, you know, about, um, it, it, it's about saving, you know, journalism in the sense of, you know, the jobs and and um, the traditional way that we we think about uh, journalism. But uh, it's also about thinking expansively uh, about the role that it plays in our society and for all of the other issues that we care about. Um, and so that's that's the framing that that I would use. Tim, <laughs> what she said. Um, um, I loved the session yesterday with. with uh, wherein it was said to approach uh, communities we don't know with some grace um, and to, to find a way to um, listen for what's actually going on, not what the buzz and the code and the divisiveness is, but to listen and um, really try to understand and give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and that's something that is in short supply. Mm -hmm. So I would just add that um, as my two cents. Well, getting people to read your work and the work of your colleagues and uh, to seek that out seems really important to that. And Jeff, I, I always think we sort of let ourselves off the hook and that we have responsibilities as citizens to, uh, to, to seek out you know, outlets and opportunities for th stories and facts. Sure, I think that's right. I mean, there is a burden on us as uh, citizens to, you know, 
keep democracy alive by a free flow of information. I guess just a couple very quick things. If you're a local official, talk to your local reporter. If you're a local reporter, like find the stories and be open-minded uh, to honestly and accurately telling the stories. And if you can contribute, if that's possible to contribute, we spend a lot of money on coffee, on fancy canned water, on beers, contribute to your local news organization because it is something that is absolutely essential to uh, democracy, I think. Do we have questions? Maybe we don't, maybe we, oh, oh, there you go. All right, hey. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Esther Kim with the University of Chicago. Um, this question is, was touched on briefly, but it's how have you seen fast news on social media affect or impact journalism and information access in rural areas? Tim? <laughs> I saw you trying to get away. Here. Yeah, um, I, I think of the weekly where I would find the school lunch menu and uh, different civic meetings, and uh, I listened to the radio to find out whether school was called off because of snow, and all of that's been fragmented. You know, you get a call if school's called off. You see uh, information on Facebook, um, and that general audience that was sort of, uh, that was served by a newspaper has been fragmented, and I think social media has further Frag, especially the fast variety, uh, has further fragmented. Jeff, uh, what about Fox News? Is it how pervasive is it in your your parts? Look, I think that um, uh, the it goes back to the nationalization of news and the ability for everyone to be outraged about the same thing. What about the local outrage? Mm -hmm. I would love to hear local outrage when I go into a town about something the mayor did or didn't do, but it's all national outrage. So I think our national outrage, it might be more productive if it was skewed a little bit more locally, and that might be um, helpful, I think, all around. How's that for dodging your fox mm. question? Yeah, very <laughs> artful. You've got a future in politics. Yeah. Right? Is there a question over here? Hi, uh, I'm Sahana Krishnamurthy, U Chicago alumna, and I work at the Cato Institute. Uh, my question is semi-related to the social media aspect, but I was wondering how would you encourage members of the younger generation to engage with their local news? I feel like the echo chamber is a really big thing, like Twitter, TikTok, even on Facebook with the older generation. So how would you, um, specifically with the younger generation, because TikTok has really taken off, and, and Twitter as well, uh, sorry, X, I guess. Um, how would you recommend that younger people engage locally as opposed to just consuming fast media that's very nationally, um, I guess, focused. You're the youngest here, why you ask? <laughs> I wish I had a good answer because I think that that would just kind of solve for everything. Um, but I, I think that I, I can answer some of that question. And I think that what we really need to focus on is some of this media literacy that I think is lacking. Um, and think about the role that schools play in that um, as well. Um, just, you know, I think that especially because there's so many ways that young people are, you know, consuming, uh, you know, information um, online without, you know, I don't know what, retweeting or sharing or, um, but the, the fact that there isn't sort of like a checks and balances for young folks to really like tap into and say, should, let me think about, you know, whether or not this is real. I mean, we, we haven't even touched base on AI. Like, that's going to open up like a whole other, you know, world of just issues. Um, but I think that media literacy is just something that we really need to th be thinking about deeply um, at a very young age and in schools. So TikTok isn't adequate for all the information we need. I love TikTok, um, okay. but <laughs> see, I told you I call on the right person for that answer. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the interesting conversation. My name is Shireen and I'm an MBA student at Chicago Booth. And I work in the healthcare setting and my, I'm aware that there has been a growing problem of hospital closures in the rural area. And with this discussion on newspaper closures, I wonder if there's a relationship between the two systems. And uh, as you mentioned that newspapers are important for public health, uh, like disp uh, dispersing information uh, to the public and also for the providers because help, they help them to anticipate internal and external developments. So what is your view on that, and how do you think the two systems should collaborate with each other to you know, help each other, each other in the community? 
That's a really interesting question, Tim. We went through a pandemic, and disproportionately in rural areas, there was resistance uh, on, on vaccines, but not exclusively. Um, it seems like local news outlets are important in these discussions. Um, I've been thinking about hospital closures and newspaper cl closures exactly as you were. Um, I mean, it, in some cases, I know someone in West Virginia who is uh, a hospital uh, PR person who's buying ads in the, in the paper <laughs> to help support it, um, even though it might not be uh, justifiable from a marketing standpoint. Um, there are collaborations in information sharing at times. Hospitals have capacity for communication. Uh, maybe some institutions can uh, go into information sharing that weren't in it before. Hospitals might be better suited for that. Um, always we have to look at the larger context that all this discussion occurs within, which is the health of the rural community that we're talking about, and they're each unique. And um, uh, hospitals are a tremendous economic driver, and when you lose one, it's a, it's a blow. And um, I would say economically much larger blow than losing a newspaper. Um, I, one difference is that in the hospital field, you have public policy that can address those issues. And uh, that's been an inadequate response, in my opinion. There have been efforts, but, and then the, uh, and with newspapers, there, is, there are efforts about uh, perhaps a, a public role, but it's not the same as what we could be doing with hospitals. I apologize to the questioner because I misinterpreted your question, but Tim didn't, so I, I, I appreciate that. But it does speak to the underlying issue, which is uh, economics. And when communities are uh, suffering economically and the market is not lucrative, uh, that is one of the problems that rural hospitals face. It's one of the problems that Newspapers face. I got time for one last question. I was told, though. So, hi, I'm Zaria Oates. I'm a reporter at ABC 24 in Memphis. Um, you guys kind of touched on this a little bit. I guess this is kind of directed towards Jeff and towards Sylvia, maybe a little bit. Um, we see a really big disconnect in our local community and in Nashville, where we don't have a bureau and we don't have. Um, we have an affiliate, but we don't have them that's owned by the same company, and that's across the nation. Uh, there's a really big disconnect in what's going on in Nashville, which is our capital, and what's going on in Memphis. How do you suggest we better cover that when we don't have the ability to put a reporter there? I mean, journalism doesn't pay, and so people aren't jumping at the opportunity to come work by themselves in a bureau, uh, let alone the news directors who maybe don't see the necessity. It's definitely a challenge, without a doubt. Uh, but I think one thing that helps with that challenge is technology. You don't actually have to have a reporter at the Capitol to watch a live stream. Like once upon a time, you know, you would have had to uh, be there and have your own eyes on it. So I think you can have more more eyes and be in different places uh, uh, just to watch that and cover that. But. Uh, you still have a local lawmakers and local legislators. So I think every story is like tying back legislation to how it affects your community, whether you're there or not. So whatever the issue of the day is, uh, or the issue of the session, if it's property taxes or um, you know, uh, um, crime or schools or whatever, just try and localize those stories. You don't necessarily have to be at the Capitol. Um, so I think those, Stories can be told anywhere. Look for people, uh, stakeholders who are going there, uh, people who have, uh, I guess, dogs in the fight, if you will, who are watching things. But I think you can uh, basically do any job with your eyes uh, um, on, on live streams or social media and localize it. So uh, we're, we're out of time. And I, I know she directed to both of you, but no I'm going to get yelled at. <laughs> Facts, truth, storytelling are essential to bridge the divide, caricatures are deadly, and the way you combat them is the kind of work that you all are doing. So I thank you for that, and I thank you for this conversation. Thank you, James.